live from Saturday, well, it's not Saturday, Wednesday, it's Wednesday night. From when... Sherman Oaks. Hi, Sherman? everybody. Chef AJ here. I always like to wait till one person logs on and says they can see me and hear me before I start because the very first episode, I went for about 20 minutes without knowing that no one could <clears> actually <throat> hear me. So, sometimes it takes a minute, so bear with us. One person? Great. Four. Wow, so then we're probably live. It always helps though if you type just, I can go. see you, I can hear you, and then we'll get started, okay? Kenny, don't turn your back on me. Don't leave. So somebody type anything, Kenny? Because sometimes we can't Yes, we got it going. Got Jennifer is here. Jennifer, thank you. You're always the first one. I appreciate that. You're probably a very good student. So here we go. So welcome to Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, and this is where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss. You're probably wondering why I'm wearing such a strange outfit today, and I'm gonna discuss that as my first question that I answer. This is episode 18, and so what I thought I would do is an FAQ, and I'm going to go over the 10 questions that I am most frequently asked about weight loss and about health in general. I realize that people are finding these videos at a different time. So this might be the first thing somebody sees, and so I actually should have probably done this in episode one, but the reality is, is I started doing these Facebook Lives because I wanted to interact with my private group of people in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, but I couldn't figure out how to broadcast just to them, which I actually do now on a regular basis. But once I started doing this to everybody, I figured, well, why not? And if you do like these broadcasts, please type in a comment and let me know if I should continue because I sort of feel like I'm saying the same thing every week, but if it helps you to hear it, I'm happy to continue. But if you do like that, please consider sharing these. There's a share button right now. You can share it live with your group on your Facebook page and I put them on YouTube within 24 hours and you can share them that way as well. So, one of the questions I get asked a lot, believe it or not, and I get emailed to me from other people asking, is if I've had any cosmetic procedures, if I've had any liposuction or tummy tucks. About five years ago, when I started losing weight, I started the Ultimate Weight Loss Program on January 2nd, 2012. And by May of that year, I had already lost 20 pounds. And that's when I read into Jeff Nelson, who founded Veg Source at the, at the uh, it was a Los Angeles health expo. I can't, oh, I can't remember what it's called. The one in Woodley Park, Kenny. What's that called? It's Veg Fest. Veg Fest. Veg Fest. Called World, yeah, it was Veg called Fest World now. Fest back then. And he had me write a guest blog about how I lost weight because he said, well, how'd you lose weight? And I said, well, I, you know, I stopped eating the high-fat foods like the nuts and I started eating potatoes. And I got dragged through the mud with that when people were bashing me left and right saying oh well she's still fat and you can't lose weight eating nuts not eating nuts and you can't lose weight eating potatoes but a lot of emails came to him that he actually forwarded to me saying well she couldn't have lost you know that much weight you know just not eating nuts she must have had you know a tummy tuck or liposuction and so I'm going to prove today once and for all that I didn't if you really know me if you've listened to my story uh, from fat vegan to skinny bitch which I have on the McDougal website and on YouTube you know that my number one fear in life is general anesthesia, that I didn't even go to a dentist until my 40s because I'm so afraid because I almost died having a general anesthesia procedure when I was in my teens because I'm asthmatic and <laughs> you will see a little manifestation of that today. I became allergic to the anesthetic. I woke up, at the time I was a respiratory therapist and I woke up being resuscitated. And since then I was so traumatized that I actually have an unnatural fear of medical procedures and the like. And you know I'm pretty transparent, guys. I answer any question. I showed you that the one cosmetic procedure I did have, I do have tattoos on my eybrows. <laughs> I showed that on my Facebook Live. The video's still there because Last I wanted week. people to not feel shame having the disease of trichotillomania, which I've had since I'm 14, so I'm pretty transparent. So that and I guess if you want to call teeth whitening that I had done in 2000 where they you know, shine a light, uh, those are the only two cosmetic procedures I've had. Um, so I've been accused of having had cosmetic surgery. I'm going to show you today because I've never done this before anywhere. I've never even worn a bikini, but wow. I'm going to be showing you what my body really looks like and show you that if I did have cosmetic surgery, I went to the worst surgeon because he sure left a lot of loose skin. Now, the reason I'm wearing this outfit is kind of interesting because if you know my story, you know that I became fat at the age of five. I was born to a morbidly obese mother who weighed and measured all her food on a scale, yet just kept becoming fatter and fatter. And by the time I was 11 years old, I weighed 160 pounds. Now that is a lot for an 11 year old, especially because I was about four foot 10 at the time. So that was obesity, maybe even morbid obesity. And 
when I was in my 20s, I got up to 200 pounds, which is 85 pounds more than I weigh today. And so people are like, well, prove it, prove it. Well, I can't really prove it with a photograph. And the reason is, is because those of you that live in California know that in 1994, Kenny, you went to Cal State Northridge just like I did. We had a major earthquake. The oh, epicenter no. was in Northridge. And even though Sherman Oaks was about, what, five or 10 miles away, I lived in an apartment building and my building was red tagged. That means that everything I owned in 1994 was gone, pretty much. I was able to get away with a little bit of clothes. Water pipes broke, and so all the photographs I had were destroyed. Everything I owned, my tele I mean, thank goodness for renter's insurance or I would have been destitute. The only other person that would have had photographs of me would have been my mother who lived in another apartment building a block away. Her building was red tagged. That meant that our buildings were destroyed. We had the National Guard there. They were unlivable. But I was able to get away with a little bit of clothes. <laughs> These past couple weeks, I've been sick with asthmatic bronchitis, and I was too sick to really do anything like go to the gym. So I decided to go through some boxes and get rid of any clothes that I hadn't worn in a year. And I found this crazy outfit that I'm wearing now. So this, I kept this, it's too big. I don't believe in keeping any of your fat clothes, ladies or gentlemen, because it's just too easy to fall back on them. So when I went from a 16 to the four that I am today, every time I went down a size, I gave my clothes away. I either gave it to somebody I knew or to Goodwill. But the reason I kept these two pieces of clothing were for sentimental reasons. I had a dog named Scooby. He was my first dog as an adult. And this, a famous artist painted him on this sweatshirt. And I didn't want to get rid of this for nostalgic reasons. But you can see that this sweatshirt, which I filled out in my 20s, is like a tent on me now. It's like a dress. So I'll take that off. And I'm a little shy about that. But before I do, I want to show you the reason I kept these shorts is because I love Scooby, because I had a dog named Scooby. even have a tattoo of Scooby-Doo right here. And so I collect Scooby stuff, so I kept these shorts. But these shorts didn't fit like this when I was 20. These shorts fit like this. You can see. So these are the clothes that I wore when I weighed 200 pounds. Now, if I had surgery, I had the worst surgeon. Now, I've had friends that have had the tummy tuck, and this is about as low as I could go without this being x-rated. You can see there's absolutely no scar, and you can see that I'm jiggly, and there's skin. There's loose skin. It's not fat, it's skin. I actually had a consult for plastic surgery, but when I found out that it was $20,000 and required general anesthesia, which I'm not allowed to have because of my asthma, I said, forget it. So this is what the Ultimate Weight Loss Program can do for you. I will be 57 in seven weeks, and I'm not comfortable staying in a bikini, so I'm gonna go change and bring Kenny on. Hello, Ultimate <laughs> Weight Loss. It's Kenny, the guy behind the camera, now in front. So questions that we always get, and this is what today is all about, is uh, 10 questions that we always keep hearing. And then one that I keep hearing about is, what about this oil, what about that oil? And the one thing I always hear from Dr. Esselstein and Ann Esselstein is the fat you eat is the fat you wear. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. I have friends that are in these different health organizations and they say, yeah, it's this oil is good, that oil is good, and then I just have to shut up because they're taking their class and what do I know? But the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And uh, spending time with Dr. Esselstein maybe a year ago or so, having lunch with the dinner with them, they, you know, again, showed the fat you eat is the fat you wear, and they said it on constantly. So and by the that's way, a story. The, this, oh, he man, is adorable. He's so single. So someone is all dressed, so I'm yep. going to get out of the way. Doesn't he look a little like David Duchovny, you guys? And he has perfect hair. He's a gentleman. He's right. vegan. He's in his low 40s. Come on. Let's hook him up, Hello. you guys. Let's find him a girl on Facebook Live today. All right, so... That was question number 10. No, I've had no cosmetic procedures on my body. Yes, I've had two on my face. So I do have a picture though to show that um, this one I have, can you see this, Kenny? This is when I weighed 165 when I was 43. And this is when I weighed 135 when I was 52. I had no idea I was gonna lose 15 more pounds from this picture. So yeah, Kenny's absolutely right. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. As a matter of fact, I had a little sign made Bailey, because Dr. McDougall and his family, his wife Mary and his son Craig, are gonna be speaking at Healthy Taste of Sacramento next week. It's in completely sold out. But Dr. Gustavo Tolosa, who does the live uh, 
webinars every Thursday with Dr. McDougall is going to be live streaming it. So for only $49, you can watch this whole day with myself and Chef Ramses Bravo competing in an Iron Chef, Kathy Fisher from Straight Up Food, Dr. Roseanne Alviera, Dr. Doug Lyle, and Dr. Garth Davis for $49, which is about a third of price of the event. And if you can't watch it live that day, and there's no travel arrangements no when, travel. You, when you have to do that. <laughs> no, it's sold out. So uh, go to Healthy Taste Online if you're interested. And we're not going to take live questions today because I'm doing the 10 most frequently asked questions. I did number 10 already. However, if you'd like to submit a question, the best way to do that is go to my website, www.eatunprocessed.com. Sign up for my mailing list there. And it gets sent to my husband, Charles, and he gets it sent to me. So one of the questions I get asked a lot, because I, I was going to do this one a little bit later, but Kenny brought up the subject of oil. You know, if you haven't read my book on process, it's a pretty easy read. You can get it on Kindle. And I really recommend you read it because I really do go into sugar, oil, and salt in this book. I call it the evil trinity. I would probably have, knowing what I know now, added flour and called it the evil cube, but that doesn't sound quite as good as the evil trinity, which is a takeoff on the holy trinity. But he had mentioned oil. And one of the questions I get, I get, I'm not kidding, over 100 emails a day at least uh, since my book came out. And one of the questions I get over and over is that, well, don't we need fat to absorb the micronutrients in our greens and our vegetables? And there's studies out there that concur, yes, that you absolutely increase the absorption of the micronutrients in your salads, in your greens, if there is some fat, like maybe if there's some avocado or another seed-based dressing. But let me ask you a question. I'm sure you guys know people, family members, friends, that are possibly overweight or sick with a lifestyle disease which is preventable on a whole food plant-based diet, reversible, maybe type two diabetes or autoimmune disease or heart disease, the number one killer of certain cancers. How many people have ever gotten sick or been hospitalized because of per micronutrient absorption? You know, when I spoke at the McDougall Man Study Weekend, there was hundreds of doctors in the audience. I've had the privilege of speaking at Kaiser Permanente. I'm actually going to be speaking there next week to several hundred physicians. And I always ask them, how many of your patients have been hospitalized or even sick because of this versus how many because of obesity or heart disease or type 2 diabetes or cancer or autoimmune disease? And what I've always said from the beginning is people tend to major in minor things. I'll get a new client that's one or 200 pounds overweight and they'll have it in their head that if they don't eat nuts, they're gonna drop dead. Well, if you have fat on your body, which apparently more than three fourths of Americans do right now, you are not gonna become fatty acid deficient, at least not in the 30 days that I recommend that you lower the fat to a no added fat content just to get those taste buds to neuroadapt from this high fat diet to a lower fat diet to get used to the taste of the food. I've explained this so many times in other talks that the reason you like the fat, whether it's the avocados or the nuts or seeds or the oil or any of the foods to the right of the red line, is because the more concentrated the calories, the more dopamine is released. And so it's very difficult to stop eating things like peanut butter and almond butter and tahini because they make you feel good in your brain. So yes, the research shows that you do improve micronutrient absorption with fat, but if you're overweight, that might be something you want to not do for a while, at least until you get your weight and you're eating under control. You know, all the doctors that are telling us we have to eat nuts, we have to eat nuts, none of them have ever been overweight. None of them have ever suffered from food addiction. And while I respect and admire them, they don't get food addiction. They just don't get it. They don't understand for people that have suffered, like me, being fat for 50 years, that when we eat just a little bit, it's like a baby bird going more, more, more. And so if you can eat nuts, an ounce a day is good without it being a trigger food, without causing you to have cravings or overeat, please do it. They're very healthy, especially walnuts, especially when raw and unsalted. I recommend that people eat seeds though because they have less propensity for binging and for overeating. You know, Dr. Russellson tells his patients eat a tablespoon of flaxseed every day, ground flaxseed or chia seeds. Put it on your salad, put it on oatmeal. oatmeal. You don't need that much fat, you guys. You know, Dr. McDougall's been saying for 40 years, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. If you don't want to wear fat, you got to stop eating fat unless you want to just start doing weighing and measuring and calorie control. <laughs> so that's that. So the other question I get a lot, and I get it sometimes this every week when we do these Facebook Lives, Kenny, is because people are just finding me and they're saying, well, what is the ultimate weight loss program? And that's a great question, and I am going to explain it. So this sign was made for me by Hope Lackey, who is just an amazing artist. <clears throat> can, can they see it, Kenny, what it says? It says, the menu, whole food, plant-based, S, sugar, O, oil, 
equals no it's oh. without sugar oil oh. salt or flour and it's left of the red line so oh, that's the diet go. of the ultimate weight loss program <laughs> but that's not what the program is so I remember when I started the program or at least when I started offering it to a wider audience by doing it online shooting videos and doing audio with my partner John Pierre we did a live ultimate weight loss program in Los Angeles it was very popular on I think it was J July 19th 2014 and that became the crux of the ultimate weight loss program that we have run online since I remember people were bashing me on the McDougal board saying well I can't believe she charges for what dr. McDougal gives away for free now, I love dr. McDougal I mean I love him I love you if you're watching I don't I doubt he would but I love you dr. McDougal I think you know I love you dearly you are just you know watch out Mary's gonna no I mean I love Mary too I mean, but I think I think he knows I love him I mean I don't love him that way I mean I could I mean he was very handsome when he was younger but hmm. you get what I'm saying is oh, he's um, still handsome isn't he? he's very handsome actually but I mean when he was younger he was like totally hot and uh, so his son is around oh his son is his son, <laughs> his son is like really gorgeous too apple doesn't fall far from the tree but I digress so oh, someone asks is there a sign or a chart for a guide for the <laughs> foods that are left of the red line? Absolutely. And absolutely. She'll get it. Oh, you stay there. It's on, it. Okay, I, I don't want to I don't want to leave the camera. Candy's going to get it. I actually sell it on my website. It's it's a magnet, but I really encourage you if you are interested, especially if you're struggling, is to join the Ultimate Weight Loss program because you'll get the magnet, you'll get the bracelet, and you'll get all the DVDs and you'll get 24-hour support from myself and John Pierre and able to ask questions. Is that good? I, so. <laughs> I can't see it. <laughs> Excuse me guys for coughing. <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful asthma. scene. All right. So anyway, so the thing is, is the dietary style of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, yes, it's exactly the same as the program, or at least the, the dietary style recommended in the book, which is called the McDougal Program for Maximum Weight Loss. That's a book. To my knowledge, it's not actually a program he runs. And it's the same dietary style that has been served and taught at True North Health to over 30,000 patients for the last 32 years. So it's not a secret. You don't. You're not paying me to tell you what the diet is. I'm telling you what it is right now. It's it's eating fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, ad libitum. These are foods to the left of the red line, and not eating processed foods and animal products, and and in either eliminating or restricting the whole food plant fats. So the diet's not a secret. You're not paying me to to learn a diet. I I've said it to free. I've said it for free forever. It's the PCRM power plate. What the fee is, is because of the support. And I, I can spend up to 12 hours online on the days answering people's questions. And this is how I interact. I do my best to answer your emails when you email me and I get emails this long and I'm behind. I've got about 700 emails I still haven't checked. So the best way to interact with me is to join the Ultimate Weight Loss Program because I give preferential treatment to that group over my own personal email. So what the program is and the reason I created it is because no program as a vegan worked for me until I went to True North Health as a patient in January of 2011, fat and sick and on medication. And this is not to, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, Kenny? Not, uh, not admonish, it's, it's, I'm not trying to criticize any other program. Yeah. Because I've said from day one that if you can do a more liberal version of the plant-based diet, if you can do Engine 2, if you can do Forks Over Knives, if you can do the regular McDougal program starch solution and be happy with your health and weight, and not be sucked into the pleasure trap and suffering from food addiction, then please do the more liberal program. But there's a group of us, and Dr. Pam Peek, when I interviewed her, said she believes it's about one out of every seven people that suffer from food addiction. And so what the ultimate weight loss is, is it takes the healthiest diet <laughs> on the planet and it combines it with a treatment for food addiction, which is a horrible word, and that's one of the upcoming questions. It's actually refined food addiction. It's the processed carbohydrates, the sugar, the flour, the alcohol, and, and the dairy and the animal products, which we're already omitting because we're a plant-based program. And this is how we support you, and this is how we help you learn the tools for recovery from food addiction. Now, not everybody in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program is a food addict. We have people in there that are doctors that are learning things to help their patients. We have food coaches that are learning you know, how to be a better coach. We have people that do not identify with the label of food addict, which we'll talk about in a future question, but they want to lose weight. So the dietary style of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program you will lose weight if you follow it as designed, whether you identify with the label of food addict or not. But for those of us that identify with the label, and a lot of people say, well, if I, if I name it, I claim it. Well, I, I, you know, I disagree because you can't change what you don't acknowledge. And until I realized I was a food addict, I, my life didn't change. 
The thing about the Ultimate Weight Loss Program is there's really nobody in the plant-based world treating food addiction. Now, there's very few in the plant-based world that even acknowledge it as, as being serious or, or prevalent. Now, there's a lot of treatment for food addiction in the non-plant-based world. You can join just about any of the 12-step programs that treat food addiction, and they will give you a food plan, which compared to the standard American diet may be sound for some, but it will be a weighing and measuring food plan, which you will have to do for the rest of your life to be successful. And if you can do that, God bless you, please do it. I am not bashing any program that worked for you, but a preponderance of the people that come to me have done the weighing measuring programs and have failed and gained their weight back and more because the research shows that they aren't really sustainable and I did a wonderful video with Dr. Doug Lyle explaining the efficacy of the weighing and measuring program and in his opinion the insanity of it which I would encourage you to watch. Now that said, as far as I know there is no other 100% plant-based program being run by somebody that is 100% plant-based and I've been vegan for 40 years now that is not only a weight loss program but a program to support you in gaining health and overcoming food addiction. Now, you don't recover from food addiction, just like you don't recover from diabetes or heart disease or cancer or obesity. You manage these diseases and you have to manage them and be diligent the rest of your life. <coughs> you know, excuse me, about 98% of people that lose weight, usually through a great deal of suffering and deprivation, weighing their food, counting calories, carbs and points, 98% of these people that lose weight gain it all back within two years and then usually more weight. The research shows that in the first year, about 66% of weight losers gain it back and then the other 22% within the second year. A lot of people say, well, why should I listen to you? You're not a doctor. Well, because I am one of the 2% of people who has now lost, depending on where you take my highest weight, between 50 and 85 pounds and kept it off for four years. Not dieting, but eating huge amounts of delicious, nutritious foods in unlimited quantities, but the right foods. And I could never do weighing and measuring because I have very insensitive stretch receptors and I like to eat and I like to eat a lot. I'm a volume eater and maybe on some level I might still be an emotional eater, but it doesn't matter because the food I'm eating is not going to get me fat no matter how much I eat. And when you truly understand what we're teaching on the first module, The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss, you too can eat this way if you desire. Now, there are people that are such emotional eaters and food addicts that they don't always lose weight right away if they're overeating just egregious amounts but you cannot gain weight at a calorie density to the left or the red line research shows you cannot gain weight so at the very least at least they're maintaining their weight while they're learning to eat a lot of nutritious foods so what the ultimate weight loss program is is a one-time fee where you get all the modules of the videos and the audio but you also get a 21 day recipe guide which are my favorite and most delicious recipes but it's the support you get. And you not only get the support from myself and my partner, John Pierre, who is a nutritional guru. He's trained every famous person in Hollywood, including FBI, military. He knows more about fitness and nutrition than anyone else, and compassion, by the way, because we actually do deal a little bit with compassion and things like cravings, or he knows a lot about uh, how to mitigate those. And, he helps with the exercise part, the things that I am not as good on, like the exercise and the compassion. <laughs> and uh, we not only support you and answer your questions, but so do the people in the group. And we have people in the group now that have lost between 100 and 200 pounds and have kept it off. We even have a mastery program now for people that are just taking it to the next level. So what the Ultimate Weight Loss Program is, the operative word, is a program. It's not just a diet. You can buy the McDougal program for maximum weight loss. Just do that. It's fine. What research shows is that most people that have this disease do better when they have support. And so we are your coaches, we are your accountability group, we are your family, we are your tribe. And that is what seems to make the most difference for people. We are now doing our third live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference. And I really encourage you to go because it's going to sell out because it's Labor Day weekend this year at Vegas at the Tuscany Hotel and the rooms are already almost gone. You can get that information on my website at eatonprocess.com. It's not just myself and John Pierre, it's Dr. Alan Goldhammer, Dr. Doug Lyle, and Dr. Carrie Saunders. So if you have any more specific questions on what the Ultimate Weight Loss Program is, please go to the UWL page on eatonprocess.com. There's a series of videos, and then if you still have more questions, email me, I'm happy to answer all your questions. All right, how's that, Kenny? It's doing good. All right, so one of the questions I also get a lot, and we've done two out of the 10 now, or have you done, that was the third, this is the fourth, is how do I determine if I'm a food addict? Well. 
Right now, the disease is self-diagnosed. And I mean by that because it's not in the DSM, which is a book that doctors use. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And the reason they have to use that book is to be compensated by insurance companies. So when you go into your doctor, and let, I mean, let's just say nothing's wrong. It actually happened to me yesterday with the asthma. I mean, there is asthma, but there was nothing else wrong. He says, well, I'm gonna say you have this because he has to write down a code or the insurance company won't pay him for his time. Well, binge eating disorder, which those of you that are bulimic or have been, I myself was bulimic for nine, nine, six years, you know it's a real disease, whether it's in the DSM or not. That recently just got into the manual. The reason that it is great to, that it is named a disease is then, with, then there can be a treatment that we can actually get help for and the doctors can be compensated. But right now, it's largely self-determined. Unlike other diseases like, let's say, diabetes, you could go to your doctor, you get a blood test, there's something called the A1C, and I believe if it's over something like six, you're, you're, he determines, he or she determines that you're diabetic by a specific number. Well, there's no number for food addiction because food addiction, again, it's refined food addiction, sugar, flour, alcohol, dairy. You know, we could argue things like caffeine and too much salt, it can fall into that as well, but it's, it's mostly the refined complex carbohydrates, not potatoes, rice, and beans. It exists on a continuum. Kenny's going like this when I said potatoes, rice, and beans. Mm. He's so cute. So it exists on a continuum. And so that means people are more or less vulnerable than others. So there are some people that if there was a tablespoon of flour in a recipe, they would be just fine. And there are other people that would be triggered by that. You know, I told the story about when I was in Big Bear a few years ago. And for dessert, we would make the banana fluff where you just take some, some almond milk and a frozen banana in the blender. And it's sort of like soft serve ice cream. And we, and we don't, I don't eat it very often now, but when we're in Big Bear, we eat it you know, every night for dessert. And one night, and this was about two years ago, I was eating it, and I, and I was very full, and I said to my husband, I said, oh my God, this is the best ice cream. And I'm thinking to myself, well, it must taste so good because I'm in the mountain air. And I said, I'm gonna make some more. Now, I never make seconds. So I went to the fridge, and when I looked closely, my husband had bought almond milk with sugar. Now, the Blue Diamond almond milk with vanilla with sugar looks exactly, they make the label the same. I didn't know that I was eating sugar, but my brain did. My food addicted brain did. This is a biogenetic disease. We're born with it. We can't reverse it. We can't recover from it, but we can certainly manage it. We can dial it down. We can learn to live with it in, in peaceful coexistence. We can stabilize our brain chemistry by not having sugar, flour, alcohol, and dairy. Now, <clears throat> the other thing is, is the vulnerability can change. So in other words, when I go to Rancho La Puerta, which is heaven on earth, and by the way, if you haven't been, put it on your bucket list. I'll be teaching there the, the last week of June. It's, it's an amazing place. And I'm all zen out and hiking six miles a day and doing yoga every um, day. You know, somebody could offer me, you know, what was my favorite dessert? Tiramisu, and it's like, I don't want that. But on the day that I had my car accident and my car was totaled, that's a whole other story. So the vulnerability can change depending on what's going on in your life. And stress, which most people have, and most people aren't doing anything to mitigate it other than medicate it. See, I want you to mitigate your stress, not medicate your stress. And most people are medicating their stress with coffee and alcohol and caffeine and sugar and flour and, or maybe drugs or smoking or things like that or shopping or things like that. So you need to find ways to mitigate your stress, you know, have more sex, do volunteer work, exercise. Now you're the sex doctor. <laughs> well, Stress is a huge cravings trigger. And so that's why food addiction, it's not like diabetes where one day you get a blood test and you're a six and one day you're four. It's going to change depending on what's going on in your life. So you have to find ways to manage your stress. As one of my favorite uh, people, Dr. Roger Gould, who wrote Shrink Yourself and has a wonderful program by the same name says, until you can manage your stress, you'll probably never be able to manage your weight. And so there are tests you can take for food addiction. I like the one on Kay Shepard's website. You can hear I interviewed her on my podcast. There's a Yale food addiction score. But the reality is, is I think if you're a food addict, you kind of know. And the reality is, is if you're 10 pounds or more overweight, you probably are struggling with some level with this disease. And it is a disease. And you can just put your hand in the sand and say you're not an addict and don't acknowledge it. So Call it something else. My favorite word is puppy. Just say you have puppy if that makes you feel better, if you don't want to feel that you're a food addict because addict has a negative connotation. I think it's empowering because once I knew that I had a disease, I looked for the cure and I found it. I created it in, in some ways. So, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ifland says maybe we should call it cravings disorder. But it is a disease. It was a disease given to us that was created by the processed food industry because there was before there was processed food, 
There was no food addiction. You go to, I just met a man from Uganda. There's no food addiction there. Parts of the world that aren't eating processed food don't have this disease. So, hope I answered that to your satisfaction. And that's what's so great about the Ultimate Weight Loss Program is that we marry the best of nutritional science, which is, you know, everything I've learned from Dr. McDougall and Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. Neil Barnard with everything I learned in the non-vegan food addiction world. And there was no place for me to get help because as I said, I love all the vegan doctors, none of them to my knowledge have ever been overweight or struggled with emotional eating or food addiction like I have. They, I could not relate to them nor could they relate to me because they just, they just didn't get it because they were very focused on their agenda as they should be of getting the animal products and the oils out of the diet and they didn't see sugar and flour as the drugs that they are. See, I want you to start thinking about sugar and flour and it, a, a, as a drug because it's not a food, it's a powder and powders aren't food. So when I see sugar or flour, which are white powders, I see rat poison or cocaine, which are other white powders or salt, which are things I just don't eat. We're not supposed to eat powders, we're supposed to eat food. And you know, people that complain about my book Unprocessed because you know I used whole food fat, <laughs> I went into it really, I think very well about the idea that we're not designed to eat processed food. We're designed to eat our food whole from a plant, not manufactured in a plant. And sugar and flour and oil, they're, they're, they're not whole foods, they're processed foods and we're not designed physiologically to eat them. And I could do, I could do a whole hour on that and actually when you take my in-person cooking class, that is what the lecture is actually about. So as I said, you know, when I've, I've tried to talk to some of the uh, plant-based doctors about this and they're either not interested or say, well, you know, okay, I believe you, but it's not my area of expertise. It wasn't until I met Dr. Goldhammer in 2011, about six years and a month ago, changed my life and, and he totally gets food addiction. And, you know, he understands that it is a disease just like alcoholism and the way you do it is by not consuming the foods that you're addicted to. And we call that abstinence. By the way, UWL is an abstinence-based program and abstinence has to be permanent. And a clean abstinence is an easy abstinence. And it is so much easier to not eat things than to do the dance with the devil back and forth where you try not to eat it and then you eat it. When you make a decision not to eat something, it doesn't require any willpower. Just like as an ethical vegan, I have not, I've made a decision 40 years ago not to eat meat. Doesn't matter how hungry I am, I'm not gonna eat meat. As somebody who keeps kosher, I could be starved, well, it's not a desert island, for a long time maybe but I'm, what I'm trying to say is if I haven't eaten for a meal or two and all that was there was bacon I'm not gonna eat it because I have this as a non-negotiable and my abstinence from sugar flour and alcohol is the same thing and for the people that are successful with this disease this is what is required with permanent abstinence but because they're still addicted they don't want to do this because they're told by other doctors that it's okay to have a little sugar and it's okay to have a little flour and it's okay to have a little salt and if you're not suffering from food addiction and you're happy with your weight, then knock yourself out. But if you've been struggling, like I did for over 50 years, then it's probably not you. Because if you could have moderated your use of sugar or flour or alcohol or oil or junk food or whatever, don't you think you would have done it already? So I say, give it a try, 21 days. You know, if you don't like UWL, you can always go back to what you're eating. All right, so uh, I, I did a good thing. I, I printed it out really big so I can see what there. So I think, what did I just answer? I answered, how do you determine if you're a food addict? So self-diagnosed for the most part. But again, you don't have to be a food addict. You don't have to claim that label if you don't like it. But if you are struggling with your weight, labels. struggling with your weight, give the Ultimate Weight Loss Program a try. You know, 21 days and see. I feel like it's a commercial. 21 days, we'll take off the weight. Nobody can promise you that. Um, okay, so. One of the questions I get a lot is so people understand that sugar is not health promoting. There's been much out there now in the popular media movies like Fed Up that show that it's more addictive than cocaine or heroin and many books written on the subject. And so they say, well, what about the fake sugars? What about aspartame, like in diet soda? Or stevia, that's a plant, right? Or erythritol or xylitol or mannitol or any of the sugar alcohols that end in OL. Well, let me tell you something, if you're overweight, and if you're struggling with food addiction, the fake sugars are worse. And as much as I hate sugar, I would much rather have somebody eat sugar than these chemistry projects. 
And everything I'm saying is corroborated in the medical research. I've heard Dr. Greger talk about it. I've heard every gastroenterologist I've ever seen lecture, vegan or not, or interviewed say that first of all, let's just talk about health for a minute because UWL isn't just ultimate weight loss, it's ultimate warranty for life. Because if you eat the way that we recommend, which by the way, we have people that are not food addicts, like Sharon McRae, because of health reasons, having a strong family history of cancer that eat this way because it's the sanest way to eat and raise her children eating this way. Go Sharon. Yeah, we love Sharon. So the thing is, is all the doctors will tell you that all the fake sugars are a nightmare for your microbiome. What are we looking at, Kenny? I know, I, I, get, Kenny, I, get, I get distracted. I, are, are horrible for our, our gut. Dr. Robin Chutkin, who wrote Gut Bliss, they all say they're a GI nightmare, number one. And many people just can't even tolerate them without bloating or diarrhea or gas, especially that erythritol. That stuff is poison. Just because it has no calories doesn't mean it, it is good for you. The other problem is, is it perpetuates the desire for you to eat more sweets. So if your goal is to eat less sweet or not to eat any sweet other than fruit, when you stimulate your tongue, which on the tip of the taste buds are for sugar and salt, your tongue tastes something very sweet when it tastes the erythritol or the aspartame or the stevia. And it tastes something sweet. And so now the brain says, oh, because if we were like in nature, you know, we'd see some ripe berries. And if we would eat them and they were sweet, we would know this is good. If we ate them and they were sour, we'd know they were probably poisonous. So you take this erythritol or xylitol or aspartame, which is like hundreds of times sweeter than even sugar. And your brain says, ooh, sweet. Something's coming. Calories are coming. We're finally going to be fed. Well, there's no calories. And so what happens is then it squirts out those hormones that actually make you hungrier. That's why so many obese people drink Diet Coke. Hungry. Because these perpetuate your cravings for sugar and they cause you to overeat and they are a GI nightmare. Uh, you know, stevia, I could argue if you had a little stevia leaf and you know, you wanted to, I don't know, chew on a leaf, that wouldn't happen, but nobody's eating the stevia leaf. What they're doing Never. is they're taking it and they're processing it. Again, the processing is the problem. The, the fake sugars go through the same refining process as drugs and alcohol. So you end up with a drug, not a food. So people have these little droppers of stevia and flavors like English toffee and raspberry and they're putting in their water. I've seen so many people get addicted to it. It's like if you it. want mint in your water, if you <laughs> put, a, put a mint leaf. That's right. Put it's, some stevia leaf, you'll be okay. Exactly. The leaf, I could argue, might be okay, but again, it's still going to perpetuate your desire for more sweet and it's still not good for your gut. So the aspartame is probably the worst. The, drinking diet soda is probably one of the worst things you could do for your health other than smoking. So... You know, the other thing is we, we deal with all addictions in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and so it's, it's sort of comprehensive this way. But these are a nightmare, so even if you don't need to lose weight, please stop the fake sugar. You're better off eating real sugar. Okay, so back to real sugar. So people get that white sugar is bad, and but say, well, what about maple syrup? Or what about barley malt? Or molasses? It has minerals, right? Or coconut sugar? It has minerals, right? Or what about agave? Guys... If you learned nothing else from me today, and by the way, please, if you like these videos, share them and let me know if you want me to keep doing it because I feel like I'm just talking to myself and saying the same thing every week. But here's the thing. If you want to eat sugar, oil, flour, salt, animal products, of course, it's your, it's your choice. The Ultimate Weight Loss Program is not a court-ordered program, although for some people it probably should be. But sugar is sugar, oil is oil, flour is flour, salt is salt. And none of them are health promoting. Sure, we could sit here all day and split hair and major and minor things like micronutrient absorption of our greens, or we can deal with the, what the real problem is. And just because something is less bad doesn't mean it's good. Now, agave has gotten so popular because, I mean, I will go to places and they'll say, oh, it doesn't have sugar, and they'll, they'll have agave in it. And the, agave is sugar, and it's worse than sugar because it's 90% fructose, which is worse than the sucrose mm. or the glucose, and it's metabolized in the liver. That's why it's been called the high fructose fraud. It's higher in fructose than even a corn syrup, which people, high fructose corn syrup, which everybody knows is pretty bad for you. And so agave is probably the worst if you're going to, if you have to eat sugar. The idea is if you have to eat sugar, the best one to eat is the one you're going to eat the least amount of. But if you really follow the principles in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, you learn to be satisfied with the fruit, the whole fruit, nothing but the whole fruit. So help you God. So, you know, people, oh, coconut sugar or Lan Ho, or they, they have all these names for sugar. Sugar is sugar. And you know, it's all four calories a gram. It all has the fiber removed. It all has the water removed. It's 1,800 calories a pound. You know, beets are like 100 or so calories a pound, but sugar is 1,800 calories a pound, and most Americans are eating a half a pound of sugar per person per year. 
It's about 900 calories a day for something that isn't even food. So the thing is, is because it's less bad doesn't mean it's good. The USDA, American Cancer Society, American Heart Association says that we don't need any discretionary calories from processed sugars. And if we do, they should be 5% or less of our total calories. Well, if you weigh 200 pounds, 5% is 100 calories. So you'll get about five teaspoons of sugar. And what are you gonna really eat for five teaspoons of sugar? You're not gonna be able to have a soda. You're not gonna be able to have a designer coffee drink or any alcohol. You're sure not gonna be able to have a dessert. And so here's the thing. Clean abstinence is an easy abstinence. And whether you identify with the label of food addict or not, you know if you have a problem with sugar. Because if you didn't, you would be able to stop eating it. It's not your fault. This disease was created by the processed food industry who puts sugar in every single processed food out there from baby formula to geriatric formula. They put it in cigarettes. You will be hard pressed to find any processed food that doesn't have sugar, fat, and salt in it. And that's why when people join UW, they'll say, well, I can't find anything at the store to eat, of course, because they don't sell food at the store. They sell food at the farmer's market and they sell food in the perimeter of the store and then maybe in the bulk section, but th there's no food in the store. Food doesn't come in a can, a box, a bottle, or a bag. It comes from nature. And exactly. the minute, re if you haven't read my book on process, please get it on Kindle now. Read that, try to understand that what Jack LaLanne said over 80 years ago serves us today, these 13 words, if God made it, eat it, if man made it, don't eat it. Now, didn't they, didn't you, didn't, didn't you, weren't you going to talk about dates? Yeah, I'm going to talk about dates in one second. I'll just make sure I finished with sugar. I think I did, you know, and, and, and again, if you really want more information, take my in-person cooking class. I really go into some more of the science about sugar and, and, and the, you know, how it's more addictive than heroin or cocaine. And that's the other thing, Kenny, is that parents, if they gave their children cocaine or heroin and somebody found out, Child Protective Services would take them away. Yet, parents think nothing of giving their kids sugar from the time they're itty bitty babies. I go to Costco and I see two year olds that don't even fit in the cart and they're pouring in these sodas in the cups. I mean, I don't get it. Sugar, if you know that cocaine and heroin are bad for yourself and your children and you don't use it or give it to your kids, why are you still eating sugar? And I knew this back in 2003 when I was still fat from eating too many high fat foods. I mean, read the book Sugar Blues, read Suicide by Sugar. So, you know, I know they're going to tell you in the plant-based world that it's a little bit's okay. And if you're not overweight and not a food addict, a little bit might be okay. But if you're overweight and if you keep eating it when you really don't want to be, it's not you. It's not you. Well, uh, Heather found you online. She saw you in some oh, YouTube places and you did teach someone just something now that agave is not good. So oh, someone is very yeah. happy. That's well, Sherry. thank you. Yes. Agave is not it's good. Not, she it's now knows. It's poison. It's poison. That's why it's so cheap. Anything, I didn't say it. She did. <laughs> <laughs> almost anything that comes in bulk at Costco, if it's not a fruit or vegetable or a paper towel or toilet paper, is, is going to be crap. So... Before I get to dates, Kenny, I just want to talk about flour for a minute because this is where a lot of people, especially flowers, are supposed to be given next week for Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. That's it's not right. about eating, right? Yeah, F L O W E R. So here's the thing: whether you eat sugar or not, and whether you eat it in the form of agave or maple syrup, sugar is sugar. Most people know that it's not a health-promoting food; that it's linked to every disease from di diabetes to heart disease to even cancer tooth decay most people know it's not health promoting they're just kidding themselves if they think it's are because they're eating some kind of special sugar but boy don't touch people's flour products after all bread is the staff of life but bread and pasta and flour whether it's whole grain sprouted Ezekiel salt free bread or pasta made out of one ingredient like lentil or chickpeas or or chickpea flour it's all, if you're suffering from food addiction, it's all the same to our brain. It's a powder, it's not a food. You know, in, in wherever cocaine was from, cocaine comes from, I guess, South America, but it comes from the, the, the cocoa leaf. And workers used to chew a cocoa leaf. It was like a mild stimulant, sort of like drinking a cup of coffee. And nobody got addicted to chewing a cocoa leaf, just like you probably wouldn't get addicted to chewing a stevia leaf. But then you take that leaf, you take the plant, and you refine it removing all the minerals and the water and the phytochemicals and the antioxidants and micronutrients, and then you're left with the powder, the cocaine, and now you have an addictive substance. Well, the same thing happens with whole grains. I don't think anybody is addicted to quinoa that I know of, but boy, is it hard for people not to eat bread and pasta and flour products. Because again, you know, it's hard, especially if you're coming from 
the vegan world and you're new to it because you're getting all these recipe books and blogs where a lot of the recipes are based on sugar and flour or fake sugars and you're told they're good and it's not that they're necessarily bad but if you're a food addict and overweight they're probably not the kind of food you want to be eating I mean I have friends that are vegan and that are slender and they can't not eat bread I mean like I, I don't want to out this person I think you know who you are if you're watching but we'll go to a restaurant I don't go to restaurants anymore but when we did I mean, he would eat the whole bread basket, whether he was hungry or not. He could Stop not, not eat now. bread. And that's the thing. It's like, whether you <clears throat> identify with the label of food addict or not, you know you have a problem if you can't not eat something, especially if you have the intention to not eat it. So, you know, I didn't learn this until probably five years ago when I read Dr. Joan Iflin's book, Sugars and Flowers, How They Make Us Crazy, Sick, and Fat, and I interviewed her twice. She's a colleague and a friend, and if somebody absolutely refuses to do my program or to do a plant-based version of food addiction treatment or weight loss, I would go to her over everyone else, even though she does the weighing and measuring. I think hers is not only affordable, but she is a very kind person, very knowledgeable, and she, she really gets what it takes to recover from this disease, even though we disagree on this weighing and measuring thing. And maybe one day I'll interview her about that. I'd really like to interview the weighing and measuring people in a forum with Dr. Lyle and Goldhammer, but none of them have accepted my um, invitation <coughs> but back to flour so flour goes through the same refining process as drugs and alcohol and it's every bit as addictive we're meant to eat food not powders and what I want you to understand and again if you get the ultimate weight loss program the first module the secrets to ultimate weight loss will explain this is that even if sugar and flour and oil were healthy and not deleterious to your health contributing to mm. obesity diabetes and heart disease they are too calorically dense for most people to include in almost any amount and be slender or certainly lose weight. You see, whole grains have a caloric density of only 500 calories per gram. And I, for, excuse me, for pound, not per gram, I don't wish. So I eat a pound of rice. I eat, I eat two pounds, I eat two pounds of potatoes for lunch like I do every day with a pound of vegetables, but I could easily eat a pound of rice. That's maybe like two and a half cups. Are you talking about brown rice? Brown or? rice. Oh, I love brown rice. And I would be full. I would activate my stretch receptors, my nutrient receptors, and my calorie receptors. But I take that brown rice and I mill it into brown rice flour to make a vegan gluten-free dessert or pasta. And now I need 1,500 calories to fill the same space in the tank. Our stomach is about the size of cantaloupe. It holds about a liter of food. And so now I've I need triple the caloric density. So the problem is, is there certain foods that are to the right of the red line that are not, say, carcinogenic and disease-promoting the way that like dairy and meat are, but they're just too calorically dense for people to lose weight on. Like another myth is that air pop popcorn is somehow a good snack. Well, the only good snack is a vegetable because you really shouldn't be snacking because most people that snack are eating for emotional reasons. They're not eating for hunger and they're overeating. So air pop popcorn is 1800 calories a pound. People say, well, I don't eat a whole pound. It doesn't matter. You don't want to eat foods without their fiber, the water, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants, and micronutrients intact. So again, go back to my book on process. It's too processed. Sugar and flour are processed foods, and if you suffer from refined food addiction, to your brain, they're drugs. They have psychoactive properties, and if you start thinking about them as the drugs that they are, that might help you stop eating them. And the fact that you can't stop eating them and that you have to argue how healthy they are, that shows me that you probably do have a problem. All right, so. Now, what about dates? So here's the thing. <clears throat> when I began my weight loss journey, there was no ultimate weight loss program. And even though Dr. Goldhammer was around, I never heard of him until I could just find the ago. right date. Uh -huh. Yeah, guys, you saw how cute Kenny is. Come on, you know, help a brother out. He's cancer, he's kind, he's a good cook. He finally got an Instant Pot. By the way, I gifted Kenny with an Instant Pot last week. He's now cooking his own beans. So ladies and gentlemen, if you live in Southern California, write me and we'll, we'll hook you up. Let's, let's do a contest, like we'll auction off Kenny for a date. I think that would be amazing. <laughs> so here's the thing, you know, I did the best I could with the knowledge that I had at the time. I didn't know a lot of the heroes, I mean, mm -hmm. I might have known them, but I didn't know a lot of the information at the time when I was starting out. And so my journey is gonna be different necessarily than your journey, because I'm giving you the benefit of my experience. And you know, Tony Robbins says that if you want success in any area of life, find somebody that had that success and see what they're doing and do what they're doing, at least try it. And a lot of people teaching weight loss programs have never even been overweight, or they're still overweight. So I think that I have something to offer here. Now, I knew sugar was bad, and I got off white sugar on July 6, 2003, when I went to the Optimum Health Institute with a Coke Slurpee in one hand and a Dr. Pepper in the other. 
I was 65 pounds heavier than I am now and I was bleeding internally from having the beginnings of colon cancer. Even though I had been vegan for 26 years, it was eating all the processed food, the sugar, flour, oil, salt, caffeine that gave me these precancerous polyps. And of course, I know that going off sugar is difficult. It's qu any, quitting any drug is difficult. Quitting smoking is difficult. I used to smoke. Of course, it's very difficult. It might be the most difficult thing you ever do, which is why very few people even attempt it. Just do it as Nike well, says. And, and also you may have to make multiple attempts, but that doesn't mean you fail because every time you have a quote failure, you're just learning more on how to help you eventually recover. So I went from eating sugar to eating dates. Now, if I knew then what I knew now, I might have done it differently, but I didn't know better, and I knew at least for my goal at the time, which was not weight loss, it was to recover from cancer and not have to have, um, it, it, uh, what's it called, Sur uh, what's it called when they open you up, that kind of surgery, not exploratory, open but, not open heart surgery, but abdominal surgery, which was my greatest fear. So I knew that dates were not going to have that kind of effect on me in making me have cancer. At least that I couldn't find any research to that effect. And so I used dates as a heroin addict would use methadone to help get me off white sugar. And in my book on process, there's about 40 delicious dessert recipes which are made from dates. Now, dates are a whole food, which means they contain water and fiber and vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants, and micronutrients, but they're a dried fruit. So they are calorically dense as compared to whole fruit, which is about 200 calories a pound to 300. Dates, like raisins and other dried fruits, are 1,300 calories a pound, but they're calorically dense, and they're still high in sugar. They're about 70% sugar. Now, there are people, believe it or not, that aren't food addicts and aren't overweight, like Sharon McRae and her family, and my book, Unprocessed, helped them all transition to this diet. So if somebody wanted to eat desserts, I could make you a German chocolate cake, oh. a peanut butter chocolate cheesecake with mm. just dates. Now, I don't even have to use date syrup or date sugar, and it would be a whole food dessert. Yes, it would be calorically dense. If you're trying to lose weight or a food addict, I don't recommend it, but I have a lot of celebrity clients that don't want to eat sugar and flour, and I can make these desserts for them, and they can satisfy their sweet tooth in the most healthy way. Now, I had said earlier how food addiction exists on a continuum, and so dates are not gonna work for a lot of people. But as you start to recover from food addiction, and your brain starts to stabilize. That could take years, guys, by the way. It can only take a few days to get over the toxic effects of withdrawal, depending on how poorly you've eaten, but to get that brain really stable where it needs to be, you need to do other restoration activities, recovery activities, like meditation, like exercise. And those of you that tell you don't exercise, <laughs> I wish I could find the clip with Doug Lyle because there's a popular theory going around right now that if you're doing a weight loss program, you shouldn't exercise because it depletes willpower. That's 100% wrong and Dr. Lyle can prove it. I just need to find the clip where he says that exercise is the quickest and surest way to raise your self-esteem, especially if you do it first thing in the morning. You know, you can eat perfectly all day and still blow it with one binge at night, but you exercise in the morning and Dr. Lyle talks about how your internal audience stands up and takes notice. You can't unexercise. You can't undo the effects of the exercise. But we are right <laughs> about three o'clock. Okay. Well, we started a little late, but I really want to try to get through this because I kind of feel like I'm on a roll. So if, if they want to log off, they can. But and guys, please share these and let me know if you want me to keep doing them. Share and put some hearts and some likes. <laughs> so, I want to see it. So here's the thing. So dates helped me because I didn't know any of this stuff. I mean, I knew enough not to have the erythritol, the stevia, and the xylitol, and all that fake crap. I knew that, but I didn't know that I was really just. I don't want to say perpetuating my food addiction, but I was, I was prolonging it, and I was certainly prolonging my weight loss. Now that said, there is nothing I can recommend as a sweetener, except for fruit. And there are certain recipes, because remember, I'm a, I'm a trained chef, I went to culinary school, and one of the things you do as a chef is you balance flavors. And to give you the most obvious example, if you buy jarred pasta sauce, for example, there's sugar in it. There's almost always sugar in tomato products because the sweet balances the acidity. I remember watching my mom when I was little make tomato sauce. Why are you putting sugar in? It balances the acidity. If you buy Prego or Ragu, you're getting more sugar in a half a cup of pasta sauce than even eating two Oreos. And so when I'm doing recipes like my quick sun-dried marinara, I will put in one or two dates, which is about one ounce of dates. Now, if that doesn't work for you, don't do it. You could probably use maybe something sweet like a roasted carrot or a beet or an apple or just omit it. And when my new book, The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss, comes out, which it should come out soon because it just went to the editor this week, I will have very specific instructions. 
<laughs> now, none of the food addiction programs allow dates, and most of them don't allow grapes or bananas or really any kind of hand-to-mouth food. That's the other thing that's wrong with air pop popcorn or snacking. You don't want to do hand-to-mouth food if you're a food addict. You probably don't want to do it anyway. You want to eat with chopsticks or a fork. So I don't recommend people eat dates as a snack or free feed on them. I don't even think I ever ate dates by themselves. It was always sugar with fat. So if I ate a date, there'd be like peanut butter or something in it like that. So. I don't recommend people eat dates, and if it's a problem for you, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be, I don't think a vegetable would be a problem, but um, we have people that have problems with bananas. If any food is a problem for you, you shouldn't have it in your house. You know by now, my number one saying is if it's in your house, it's in your mouth, and there's really no exceptions to that. And maybe one day I'll do a whole episode on really the, the science of the environment. I've been taking a, a course in brain addiction at the university, and I've learned some amazing things about how crucial the environment is and why it really is the number one predictor of your success. So. I really don't know what to do about this date thing because at True North, dates are allowed. Now, they're not used in very many recipes. It's usually as uh, if they're making a special dessert, and desserts are only served there a couple times a year. But I don't know any other way for you to sweeten things or to balance flavors because I'm certainly not going to recommend sugar or any of the fake sugars. You know, I've been experimenting with using pears lately, and I'm having some success with that. I've got some new recipes. So I'm trying to take out the, the little bit of dates in the recipes. But if you join the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, you get a 21-day recipe guide, and only three of the recipes have dates, like three dates, that's the yummy sauce, and they're always in savory recipes. So what I say is, when in doubt, leave it out. You know, I mean, we get these questions, well, can I have you know a tablespoon of chickpea flour in this recipe? We don't know what's gonna be a trigger for you, and we don't know what's going on in your life at that time to know how triggered you are gonna be. So when in doubt, leave it out. And then when you get down to your slim ideal weight, if you wanna experiment by adding some of these foods, you can. So dates are a gray area. I see them as methadone, and I also see them if somebody is just freaking out, and they're gonna binge, and they didn't call me or text me, or reach out to another member of the tribe in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. And if they said, look, if I don't have a date with almond butter, I'm gonna go to Baskin Robbins and have a five fudge sundae, I think it is as good, better, best. It's still a whole natural food. I got some research from Dr. Greger showing that even though it's 70% sugar, it's still the most favorable sweetener for people that are diabetics, at least type two. So again, I wish I could give you a definitive answer, but I don't feel I can tell each person what they can or not have. I don't think that food addiction is a one-size-fits-all disease. I think it's a one-size-fits-most. I think I'm gonna be proven to be right about that, that sugar, flour, and alcohol are things that no one that identifies with this disease or is overweight should probably have. They're not health-promoting. But I don't know about the dried fruit. I do know that it's calorically dense and it's not gonna facilitate weight loss. It's better to eat fruit in its whole form. Okay, so I think I have two more questions. I'll try to go quickly. I get a lot of questions about salt. What's different about the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, too, is it's the only program I know of that recommends you don't eat salt. And if you read Dr. McDougall's book, The McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss, in that book, he talks about not having salt. See, his dietary recommendations in that book is the same as UWL, is the same as Dr. Goldhammer, which is salt-free. Now, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> so people say, well, what about Bragg's? What about Tamari? What about miso? Again, just like with the dates, you know, good, better, best. There's 2,300 milligrams of sodium in a teaspoon of salt. And if you eat enough calories from whole natural food, you'll get about 500 milligrams of sodium a day. Now, if sugar, fat, and salt, or sugar, oil, and salt, salt is always the hardest. Even for people that are sugar addicts, salt is always the hardest. It is very easy to replace oil in your diet. It's the easiest thing. Unless you were to fry foods, which we don't recommend for anyone, whether they're vegan or not, it is so easy to replace oil. And that's what I did in my book on processed. All the recipes that have things like hail to the kale dressing with almond butter, it's mm. super easy to replace oil and still get that mouthfeel and creaminess. You can use whole food fats like tahini and nut butter and avocado, super easy. You can water saute, I show you. I've probably 65 YouTubes of the chef and the dietitian. I have 13 episodes of Healthy Living with Chef AJ on TV and online now, where each week I show you how to use a pressure cooker, and I, I do show you these things, how to saute without oil. Super, super easy, easy to bake without oil. I was a pastry chef at a regular not vegan restaurant for years, and I didn't use oil or sugar or salt, and I, I don't think I even use flour except in, in maybe one dessert. So that, all that stuff is possible if, even if you're not trying to lose weight, it's super easy. 
with sugar, it is easy too. It's it, it, because you can do over the dates. You can do those kind of sweeteners like I recommend in the book on process. Salt is hard because there's no substitute for salt. Now, of course, you can get that fake salt by Morton, which is potassium chloride, which is chemicals again, which I don't recommend. But nothing really tastes like salt. Now, I recommend Benson's Table Tasty. If Kenny wants to get it in the kitchen, I'll show it to you and I can get you a 10% discount. For me, that's the most realistic salt substitute. It's absolutely delicious. I don't need spices now, you know, because spices, even healthy ones like herbs and peppers and stuff, that can perpetuate overeating. But here's the Benson's Table Tasty. <coughs> the website is bensonsgourmetseasonings.com. If you use my name, Chef AJ, you'll get 10% off. I believe if you give her a dollar for postage, she'll send you a free sample. I know some of you have complained about it clumping. She has reformulating it so that it doesn't clump anymore. She has lots of varieties, but this one is the one that tastes most like salt. It also is black pepper free, which is important for me being allergic to black pepper. And it's also garlic free, which is important to some people. I have several friends that are allergic to garlic. So it takes about 30 days to neuroadapt from whatever diet you're on to a lower salt diet. And there could be some discomfort in that time where the food won't taste good. Now, if you're overweight and trying to lose weight and you don't like the food, that's kind of a good thing if you're not gonna eat as much. The thing about salt is it stimulates overeating. It stimulates the appetite and so you will eat more when you salt your food. And if you're trying to lose weight, that is not a good thing. Now, I recently heard a doctor talk about the link between salt and obesity, something I haven't heard before. So I'm trying to track him down on the internet and, and uh, research him about his claim that salt actually contributes to obesity. And I searched PubMed and Medscape and I found lots of articles that show a link between salt and obesity. So I think that is something I didn't know before. I'm gonna discuss with Dr. Goldhammer. But the thing is, is the more you, season your food, whether it's with salt or pepper, the more food you're going to eat. And if you're trying to eat less, then this may not be a good thing. Now, food can taste amazing without salt. I've proven it with my recipes like red lentil chili. I mean, people, regular people eat my food. Kathy Fisher has proven it with her delicious recipes It's straight up food. Chef Bravo. It's very difficult for chefs to do this because see, they don't eat this way. And when you eat salt, you can't taste food without salt, but 30 days, your taste buds get dialed down because you're not assaulting them with salt and whole natural assaulting food. Assaulting them with salt. You see that? Whole natural foods start tasting good. When you get off salt, you can eat a piece of celery and go like, oh my God, or chard. It's like, this is so salty. It's like the ocean. Now, salt is not always a deal breaker. And, you know, I, it's not like if you come to the ultimate weight loss, oh, we have to be perfect. None of us are perfect. I eat salt. And what I mean by that, I don't actually eat it. But I know that when I travel, there's salt in the food occasionally. I sometimes can't get to the store called Sprouts to buy the salt-free mustard and use a low-sodium Dijon. Last night we made french fries for dinner and I was too lazy to make ketchup and I ate the unsweetened with salt. I'm not perfect with the salt, but I'm, I'm nearly perfect. I, I don't eat it very often, but I do know when I eat it, I sure get hungrier and I sure eat a lot more of whatever I'm eating. So what about this Celtic sea salt and Himalayan salt? It's got minerals. Well, we're not eating salt to get our minerals. That's what we're eating vegetables for. We're supposed to eat a lot of vegetables, and especially if you're trying to fight food addiction and recover and lose weight. So salt is salt. If you absolutely have to use salt, then I recommend you do it the way Dr. McDougal recommends, where you sprinkle it on the surface of your food, where your taste buds can taste it, not cooking with oil, sugar, or salt because it dissipates. Bragg's is, yes, it's lower in salt, than, than, than table salt, but if somebody wanted to use something, I would recommend raw coconut aminos because it's about a third the sodium of Bragg's. It's only 95 milligrams per teaspoon. I think Bragg's is, three, I'm not sure 300, but it's much higher. I believe Bragg's might have soy too, and I'm allergic to soy. Tamare is about between Bragg's and that. Miso, you can get some low sodium ones. <laughs> so like sugar, if you absolutely have to use salt, Use, choose, choose the one you'll use the less. But the thing is, is when you're not using oil, which coats the taste buds of your tongue, you don't need as much salt. You know, might not need any, but you know, I would give it, it's worth doing an experiment for 30 days because once you get off salt, you can really taste the subtle notes in a piece of romaine that tastes sweet like, like, like vanilla extract. But you can't taste in my mouth and you can't feel in my brain. It takes some time to neuroadapt. And if you don't know what neuroadaption is, it's sort of like, you go to, oh, I'll give you an example of neuroadaption. I took a candle making class 
over the weekend and the smells I don't like you know, like smelly smells like incense and the smell was just like oh my god I'm not gonna be able to breathe this is horrible and then at five minutes into the class I I couldn't smell it anymore that's neuro adaption that happened with smell well that can happen with taste and that can happen with brain chemistry but it just takes a little time we can talk about that more in a future episode What's VBF VBF is you mean VFB that's what I meant. VBF is what a dyslexic calls VFB. That's me. What, that's like a joke. What do you call a dyslexic agnostic insomniac? Somebody, no, wait, yeah. A dyslexic agnostic insomniac, somebody who stays up all night wondering if there's a dog. But um bum Okay, <laughs> anyway, I just interviewed a stand-up comedian on my show, so I've got little jokes. So vegetables for breakfast. You know, for people that don't really understand my program or know it, I've been criticized where they've said, well, Chef AJ forces you to eat a pound of plain steamed kale in the morning and drink the water. And that's not true. But we do recommend vegetables for breakfast. We don't say that's all you can eat, but we recommend that if you are fighting food addiction or sugar addiction, that you start your day in a savory way, like most of the world does. It's only pretty much in the United States that we start with flour and caffeine and sugar. 67% of people for breakfast eat cereal. We're talking about box cereal. I mean, if you want to eat cereal, eat a whole grain. Eat, you know, teff or millet or amaranth or, uh, you know, or, or steel cut oats or better yet, the whole oat growth. And so as I traveled around the world and started interviewing people from other countries, I found that every other country had vegetables as part of a healthy breakfast. And so we, first of all, we recommend you start your day in a savory way. So if you are going to eat oats, don't eat oats with fruit because that becomes your bread, the oats, because you're probably not eating oat groats or steel cut oats. You're probably eating the processed rolled oats or the instant oats. And the fruit becomes your sugar and you got the bread and the sugar, you got cake. You're doing that because you're trying to get dessert. So eat oats, but eat savory oats. Do my recipe for risotto with shiitake mushrooms and garlic and kale and sun-dried tomatoes. Eat savory breakfast, because the sooner you activate that sweet taste, the more you're gonna crave sweet the whole day. So I'm not telling you not to eat fruit. Save it later in the day for a treat when your brain can handle it. And so we do recommend that you start your day with at least a pound of non-starchy vegetables. It doesn't have to be greens but greens are probably the healthiest. You know, Dr. Esselstyn tells his patients to eat greens six times a day, at least the size of their fist. So we recommend that you, if you can't eat greens right away, work your way up to it, but there's over 30 non-starchy vegetables if you were to Google it. Cherry tomatoes are technically a fruit, and cucumber and zucchini technically a fruit. These are 67 calories a pound. I eat between two and four pounds of non-starchy vegetables every day for breakfast, and so I think a pound of asking others is fairly reasonable. If you roast them, like do my recipe for the balsamic Dijon glazed Brussels sprouts, when you roast a pound of Brussels sprouts, you get less than two cups of food. It fits into a cereal bowl. It's not that much food. Now, of course, if you're eating all your food raw, a pound of, of food, a pound of vegetables can look very, very voluminous. But then again, if you're trying to lose weight, raw is probably better than even cooked. So vegetables for breakfast has been the one characteristic that all the biggest winners that we interview say has been the most important tool towards their recovery. And all the people that have relapsed said that that's always the first thing they let go. <laughs> so my asthma is a little bit <clears throat> not so great. I've been talking a long time. I appreciate you watching live or watching later. I'd also appreciate if you like these videos. You know, I've done 18, I don't really so know. So many people like them, they say, I'm please not, keep doing I'm them, to, I'm not trying to get you to <clears throat> stroke my ego, but I, I feel like I'm I've said you, everything that I could say. So hopefully, if you do want to share this, I tried to be as comprehensive as I could on this video as to where I stand on diet and food mm -hmm. addiction. So maybe this will be the one that you share right now on your Facebook page or later Lucky on Lucky 18. YouTube. Lucky 18. It's, it's a very it's special life. number to me. Lachai, to life. So thank you guys so much for your support, for watching. I hope to see you at Healthy Taste of Sacramento on the online so I can say hello to you. Hello. And hello. And thank you so much, Kenny. We got lots of hearts and happy faces thank and you. likes here. So. Bailey is, is bored to tears right now. So thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Chef AJ, and I really do believe that you can have both the health and the body that you so richly deserve. Bye, everybody. Yes, that's a wrap.